Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and thank you for joining me today. I'm in a reflective mode today as I look forward at where we are likely to go in the next few years in relation to COVID-19. From a clinical point of view, I usually say to anyone, I expect the next 15 to 20 years to be completely dominated by issues around the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not being very specific about all of the areas, but I think that all the factors that are involved in the pandemic are going to be relevant. The trouble is, is that at the moment, it is largely a lot of theoretical work based around my research into autoimmunity. I've become reflective after having a very important discussion just yesterday with Thomas Haviland. Now, this gentleman has done something that I think is putting the rest of the scientific community to shame. When he heard about abnormal plots by Ambamas, he took it upon himself to analyze the data by reaching out to embalmers across the world. Remarkably, his data indicates that 66% of those who responded were seeing these abnormal fibrous clots. That's a problem, because how would we corroborate what they are seeing if we are not ourselves doing significant research? So in my reflective mode, I then thought, well, what is on the horizon with regards to further investigations? And this is why I have the title Ongoing Vaccine Animal Studies as the template for what we would therefore do. It's important to get things into perspective. And I have got uh, here a very important, very straightforward paper with regards to the promises of speeding up changes in requirements for animal studies and alternatives during the COVID-19 vaccine approval. And this was done, I think, by a team in Netherlands and Denmark, and they interviewed a number of people uh, with regards to the processes and the changes that occurred with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it's important to understand the baseline as to how things are normally done. And that's why I have an abnormal on it. What is normal? And when you know what's normal, you can then reflect on what is different. So in the normal situation, based from this paper, they highlighted that normally a vaccine development will take about 10 years because of all of these studies, phase one, phase two, phase three, all done in sequence, starting with the non-clinical research, then there is scientific evaluation, then production, and then studies after authorization before the vaccine is formally available for use. That's normal standard practice. It seems that in the context of COVID-19, and again, we had a pandemic and you can't blame, I guess, the governments and the scientific community from therefore trying to see if they can speed things up because of the pandemic. And out of that, this is what the paper highlighted. This is what we have got in our current situation. The vaccine was available for use after relatively truncated phase one, phase two and phase three including the scientific evaluation, which overlapped all of them. Large-scale production was, again, started before you had gotten the full um, um, routine, and studies after authorization occurred after the vaccine was available for use. In the context of the pandemic and the concern from the uh, regulators and the, um, the public health, you could probably say, okay, that's reasonable. But in reality, would you not have expected them to do ongoing studies in relation to what had happened? So meaning that they have done the 
quick rollout, but you would then expect a degree of corroboration of what was done to make sure that this is following along the path that is expected. When we look carefully at the paper, and I bring this up here again, they highlighted in the, um, before they reached the discussion, the differences. One, they noticed a difference in the number of animal studies performed during the preclinical phase of vaccine development. So they only identified four studies in the preclinical phase. Two involved mice, uh, one involved rhesus macaques, and the other one was in vitro. They could identify no toxicokinetic studies in the preclinical phase. Now, this is where it gets interesting. There were no gene toxicity and carcinogenicity studies performed because all the components of the vaccine constructs, constructs were lipids and RNA, and therefore not expected to have any of this kind of potential. That was the principle with regards to why this was not done. Now, you have to remember, this technology has never been rolled out at scale. And so we have taken quite a number of assumptions with regards to what was likely to happen. It goes even further when we look at a bit more of the details. What they highlight here again is that no separate studies have been performed to determine local tolerance or generate data on prenatal and postnatal development, including maternal function, dosing, or evaluating offspring, which is why it was initially not recommended in pregnant women. Now, you have to remember that there was a change in the recommendation to the point that it was pushed in the context of pregnancy. Now, some people have argued that they did this without the correct approval. There is clearly, based on this paper, certainly some concerns about that. It's important, again, as we put in the final bit of this section, there was no data on reproductive toxicity as provided during authorization either, as it was not deemed necessary at the time of approval. And the reason this was done was because certain assumptions were made, and they go into that in terms of the paper, because animal studies take time, and they had to do this using data, not just from the limited animal studies that they did, but also from human data, human trials, where they use data from that to come up with the conclusions. So within that framework, that's the reason that such limited studies were done, taking it a step further. Because I then ask, well, are they doing any ongoing studies? So what did I do? I went here. This is the World Health International Clinical Trials Registry Platform. And I have searched this in all of the, um, the terms. Now, this is a limited term looking for just animals generally. And in every single search pattern, there is nothing. There are no searches for any trials that are ongoing. And so what you have to realize is that this registry platform is where you would register any studies that are ongoing so that somebody doesn't replicate exactly what you are doing. So they have registry platforms. And I would presume, and I'm not an expert in this, that this WHO one international registry trials takes into consideration all of the registry trials across the world. I have not seen any evidence of animal studies. I've always been talking about autopsies. And similarly, when I searched that, I did find two studies, one in Germany, which is ongoing recruiting, and one in Spain, looking at autopsies in the context of patients who had COVID-19. And specifically, the question that I'm looking for is what happens when a patient is vaccinated with COVID-19 and dies? What is the pathology? How is it different from that of the unvaccinated. 
That's something that I'm planning to cover. And if you're interested in this, look out for this course. That will be, it was a pre-launch and you can follow the information to hear about my assessment of what I think is going on in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. So look out for that. But stepping back to the principles, in reality, what this indicates is that we have very limited ongoing research that would potentially be able to answer questions like what has been raised about the embalmer's clots. We don't know. Not only do we not know, we don't have enough studies that are coming. Remember, we need thousands of autopsies to be able to make any conclusive understanding of patterns of disease. What has happened is that it was deemed unnecessary. Is that normal? Is that what you expected? Because certainly for me, that's not what I expected. We are at a stage now of the pandemic where realistically, if things start to go wrong, we have no way of easily trying to figure it out because we have not done the appropriate research. Who is responsible for that? Why has it not been done in parallel I can understand it wasn't done early because of speed, but why would you not do it ongoing? These are very important questions, especially as we reflect on some of the patterns like these embalmer's clots. At the moment, without autopsies, either in animals or in humans, we are blind. We are flying blind into the next few years. Let me hope that my research into autoimmunity is off target. Because if it is on target and we have a situation where we are triggering autoimmune responses around spike proteins, either from infection or otherwise, the next 15 to 20 years could be very, very challenging for the whole population. I hope that this doesn't come to that but without the research, we really are flying blind. Have a great evening, everyone.